Welcome to Healthcare Du Jour, where we dish up and digest the latest in healthcare. For the next 30 minutes, sit back as we bring you insight, commentary, and discussion on trending topics to the table, all expertly served up by our host and his guests. Healthcare Du Jour is brought to you by Carium, the telehealth platform enabling healthcare's digital transformation, helping you care for people within the fabric of their daily lives. Now, here's your host, Matt Fisher. Welcome back, and thank you for joining as we dive into the hottest topics in healthcare. I'm your host, Matt Fisher. On the menu today is Dr. Cynthia Brandt, CEO and President at the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health. Cynthia, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Matt. I'm so glad to join you. So, Cynthia, what I always like to do at the beginning of my discussion is give my guests a chance to provide more of an introduction in terms of who they are and what they do. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, let me start by just talking about the foundation, the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health, uh, where I'm CEO. Uh, we are just all in on maternal and child health. We support uh, two really world-class institutions, uh, the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, and also the School of Medicine at Stanford University. Uh, we also have a grant-making program uh, where we're reaching out and, and trying to improve the system of care for kids with special health care needs. So for me, it was just a dream to get to come do this job. I've been here since 2018, and it brought together these two passions for me of uh, changing health care, improving the lives of kids and moms and families, and philanthropy uh, that I believe in so deeply. So I'm, in, I'm incredibly lucky to be here and so grateful. So I'm always interested to know, is this your first position in healthcare or have, did you have a background in healthcare before? This is, let me say, when I was interviewing in 2018, that was a big question because no, I have not worked in healthcare. Uh, we are an academic medical institution and I have worked in higher education quite a bit before. So at Stanford and at a small, wonderful women's college in Oakland called Mills College. Um, but I've also worked with uh, scientists. So I was at the Smithsonian and worked with people doing incredible work in all kinds of different scientific disciplines. So one of the things that I, I said in this job is I have that kind of voracious appetite to learn about it. And yes, it'll be a steep learning curve for me to learn healthcare, um, but I'm extremely motivated uh, to figure that out. And how have you found that learning curve to be now that you've been in the role for four years? It's humbling, right? Because uh, learning about the clinical enterprise and even the business side of healthcare and, and hospitals, children's hospitals, understanding the economic model, that was all new for me. Um, and then the discovery science uh, and translational medicine piece that we represent and we raise money for um, is sort of in endless learning. You're, you're never done. Um, and so it's pretty humbling. And we, we really work across our organization to know our faculty and know our clinical leaders um, and partner with them really closely and just realize we don't have to be the experts. Uh, we just need to know um, uh, enough to really help our, our donors or potential donors connect with the faculty and, and program experts. Uh, so I've loved it. I've loved getting up to speed and I will humbly say it's a long, long learning curve. Um, in, this, in this field. Yeah, and I don't know if you have to be humble to say that because I think it's just the, the absolute truth of it. It's, you know, in healthcare, I feel like you never stop learning or, and you never stop mm -hmm. having the opportunity to learn because kind of, as you said, things are always changing. You know, the, there's the science behind it where the understanding is evolving over time. And, you know, frankly, to me, that makes it one of the most appealing industries to be in because you can always find something new or be able to learn something new. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. And even just following one field. So one of the things we uh, work on, we have a, a campaign uh, for mothers and babies. And a piece of that is about maternal fetal medicine or high risk obstetrics. And just following that field and the different components of maternal fetal medicine, I, I mean, is, is like opening a world of potential and seeing the incredible discoveries that, that are being made right now, uh, fetal therapy, for example, that just are mind blowing. And so a, a constantly new fr frontier. So you've mentioned that you're at a foundation and you've kind of you know, referenced um, fundraising and, and finding donors. You know, since this is the first time, first time I'm talking with someone from a foundation in the healthcare world, 
Can you just maybe provide a little bit of a grounding in terms of what it actually means to be a foundation and you know how that fits into the system that you're connected to? Yeah, yeah. So, so for nonprofit um, medical institutions, um, there's almost always a fundraising arm. Um, your listeners might might know it as development uh, or fundraising or philanthropy or advancement. Um, we think of ourselves as partners with the medical enterprise, whether it's an academic medical institution where I am uh, or a nonprofit hospital. And it's so important that people in my business, my profession of fundraising, really work closely with the folks at the hospital or the school or um, so that you're designing, first of all, so that you understand the priorities and the opportunities and that you can help make the match between what donors are interested in and what it is that your institution really wants to do next, where the potential to have an impact is. Uh, so some of our work in, as uh, philanthropy professionals is that kind of matchmaking of donor and institutional priority and opportunity. Uh, so that's one of the things we love in this field is getting to be that kind of partner, like a trusted partner with both the folks on the medical side and with our donors um, and bringing, bringing them together. Uh, we also, I'm, I'm extremely passionate about creating really good business plans before you ask for a gift. So for example, a gift to uh, grow our program in um, one, that, one that philanthropy has really changed for us is inflammatory bowel disease. And before we could ask a donor, we knew this person was interested in supporting this program, but before we could talk about a gift, we had to really understand what do we already do? What's the business model? What's the, uh, what's the need here in our community uh, to, to have more clinical enterprise? What are the opportunities on the research side to totally transform our understanding of you know, is it genetic causes? What's the inflammatory process? How, um, how can we intervene to help kids with IBD? And what's the kind of, what are the inputs that are needed in terms of, you know, is it in this case, uh, the donor helped us really relaunch a clinic for IBD with really holistic wraparound care um, for, for kids there. So for example, dietitians. Um, social workers, as well as other parts of the care team. So understanding what was needed, needed, building that business model, and then understanding on the research side, okay, is it that we need to recruit new people? The answer in our case was yes, some new, new scientists. And how can we harness the huge power of Stanford science to put behind this? So this gift included uh, a seed grant program and a postdoc program really that's about unlocking Stanford science and, and, and incenting people, incentivizing people to, to turn their attention to this really important area. So that partnership was just essential in developing that and getting a really strong business plan um, to, to be able to go to a donor and, and really talk about a, a transformational gift. And it sounds like as you're talking about that business plan, it's really partnering with your affiliated institution and you know, is it fair to say that you're helping to guide them to understand how they'll effectively utilize the, the funds that you're raising on their behalf? It's back and forth, for sure. Um, and I would say part of the thing I, I try to help my partners uh, in, the, in the hospital or the school understand is that philanthropy is a market business. So we can have things that we desperately want to do, clinical uh, areas we want to expand, or research areas we want, or, or things that we want to take to clinical trial, and they can all be good and important and urgent and even potentially life-saving, and they still may not find a donor. And that it's it's actually it's a very hard thing for me and my team, and also for our partners on the on the medical side because it feels so important and urgent. Uh, everything does. So that's one of the things that I think is is a big part of understanding working. If you're a physician or part of a care team or a hospital medical administrator is understanding it's about the market fit. Uh, we have to find the things that are interesting to donors and that they want to have an impact on that also fit what, what the hospital or uh, in my case, the school of medicine want to do. So when you're trying to find that fit, are you starting with the donor side, the 
the institution side, or is it just a kind of a mix and match of both, depending on where you might get the information from first? So it's interesting, different fundraising shops, meaning at different institutions, are better or more skilled or more experienced at different, at those two ends. So our shop, before I arrived uh, at our foundation, is so good at really crafting something for each donor. And they're gifts that absolutely fit hospital priorities, but it was really custom for each donor. And as we try to scale up and grow and reach more donors and raise more money to have a greater impact uh, on our mission, we are learning and doing more where we develop a fundraising priority even before we know who the donor or donors will be. Um, so we're, we're, and then there are other shops who are really good at that. They, they sort of pre-made a whole bunch of priorities and that's what they're out talking about. And, and they're not as much uh, listening to donors and following donor interest. I would say we're getting to be good at both. And that's the key of success. Yeah, I think you know, being able to strike a balance between you know multiple interests that you know I'm not going to say are competing because at the end of the day they're probably more aligned than not. But you know it's always good to have a balance as opposed to swinging too far in one direction or the other. Right, right. I totally agree with you. And having those conversations where you're saying, "I know you really want to do X," you know, like just a clinical trial, for example, and we we want to do that, but it might take us a while to find the right donor. So let's talk about here are some things we're hearing from donors that they're very interested in. Um, that are relevant to your work, where we know you do some work. It's not the thing you're talking to us about, but let's talk about that too. And should we develop some of those into opportunities for people to make a gift? Um, so the back and forth, as you say. Yeah, and and actually, I have a, kind of a, another kind of, I guess, foundational question that I think I should have asked a few minutes ago, which was, you know, we, you've mentioned a few times that you're working with you know, the particular medical center that you're connected to. So is it typical that foundations are tied primarily to supporting one, uh, you know, healthcare institution, or are you, is there the opportunity to provide funding or support to the broader community as well? Mm -hmm. That's a great uh, question. Something I'm really interested in, uh, Matt, most nonprofits, medical nonprofits have a fundraising arm like ours. And it is that one-to-one, -one, you know, partnership. At the same time, there are all kinds of community organizations, national and international organizations dedicated to children's health. And I hope that people who are thinking about their philanthropy, and I want to be clear, when I say philanthropy, I mean your time, your expertise, as well as your financial resources. So when you're thinking about how can you make an impact with your time, your expertise, and your money, that you think about your community and you think about broader national or international needs as well. Sort of like you think of your investment portfolio. You want to be diversified. You want to try to make an impact on the same issue. I mean, I hope everybody supports children's health, um, but you want to do it in a bunch of different ways. So there are a number of organizations um, that, that are working at that more international level, for example. Yeah, so again, it kind of sounds like it's you, you find complementary pieces, and you know, to, you know, kind of explore for ways to support each other. A good example for for us um, has been a long term partnership from uh, our School of Medicine and Packard Hospital with the March of Dimes. Uh, when the March of Dimes, they had a very long term. Uh, at least a decade of investing in research on prematurity, premature birth. And they established a number of centers at different academic medical institutions, kind of a network. And uh, we, we were one of them, uh, led by uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. David Stevenson, who's just a, a giant in the field uh, of prematurity research and neonatology. And so it, he worked you know, with March of Dimes, he worked across the Stanford campus, he worked with these other, um, the other centers that the March of Dimes supported at other institutions to really like catapult the field forward of understanding premature birth and figuring out how we can predict it um, and how ultimately, of course, we can prevent it and mitigate the consequences of, of, of premature birth. 
So that's, I think, a, an awesome example of a, a well-known national or international organization, March of Dimes, really partnering with medical institutions and helping us build that network across multiple institutions and the partnership you're, that you're talking about. And, no, I think, as you said, those connections are very interesting. And it's, you know, you, you probably never know where they're necessarily going to come from. And for those of you just joining, I'm talking with Dr. Cynthia Brandt of the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health. We've been kind of talking a lot about what, what does it actually mean to be a foundation and providing support to an affiliated organization. And uh, Cynthia, I want to kind of pick up on something that you said a, a minute ago that, you know, and I think it was a very important um, clarification that you made, which is that philanthropy is about more than just donating money. It's about mm-hmm. you know donating your expertise and time and other support. It's a, how you know thinking about your foundation. How do you go about identifying the folks that you want to get involved? You know, maybe for more than just you know a, a monetary donation, but for um, you know kind of that personal time or other um, other form of commitment. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you for that question. I think that kind of engagement with the community is essential. But kind of, you might be, your question might be implying this. It's sort of hard to figure out uh, how to organize it or if you're a community member, how to get involved. Like, how, how can you give your expertise? And so we have a number of different um, volunteer opportunities, some that are organized and run by the hospital itself. For example, they have a really robust program at Packard Hospital of a parent mentor program um, that we actually support from the, from the foundation. And that so that's a kind of expertise. If you've, you've had a, a child at our hospital or a child with special health care needs, we need you to get involved. That's a kind of expertise to help other families navigate the system. If you have some professional area of expertise, uh, there are a lot of different nonprofit boards who really need that service. So, for example, on my board, uh, I just had a committee meeting today of our audit committee, and I sure need experts who are paying attention and have that kind of depth, and they're going to go look at the 990 uh, with me and really dig in and understand and, and exercise that kind of kind of oversight um, that nonprofits de- really depend on in terms of governance. So, I would say, I hope. I mean, all of your listeners care about health and improving health. I hope they all care for about improving health for moms and kids. And I would just say, look inside and say, what's some skill or expertise you have, whether it's from your personal experience, your family experience, as I was mentioning, uh, professional expertise, maybe it's something you want to do with your kids, like a volunteer experience to help teach your kids the value of helping other people or giving back or learning about uh, other families. Uh, We have programs to do that too. Uh, We have something uh, called Champions, uh, Champions for Kids. And it's a way that um, families can come together and or communities and organize around a particular, usually it's a clinical passion that they have a particular clinic and then organize an event, organize like someone did a lemonade stand uh, for example, and in this case, they, there is a monetary contribution um, from the golf tournament or from the lemonade stand or someone's bar mitzvah, for example, they, they made gifts, um, but it's really more about the engagement and less about the actual dollars. I mean, every dollar matters. It makes a difference, um, but those, those examples are just ways to, to get involved that matter so much more than that. No, and that insight, I think, is very helpful because it's, you know, as you were just saying, each person can find their own way that they want to be able to contribute. And I think part of it is just reaching out and making making an offer or exploring what opportunities are already put out there. And, you know, I, I hopefully this is a fair statement, but most foundations, they're going to find a way for you to be able to help out and get involved. <laughs> not, if you express an interest, you're not going to be turned away. That's right. That's right. We're we are always looking for new people to talk to and get engaged with. And I I think I can speak for my colleagues across the country. Um, we are eager um, to meet new people who have a passion and believe in the mission of improving health and improving equity and access to health care, for example, and all of the things that we all work on. Um, something that just occurred to me thinking about your audience is 
sometimes when you work in the business side of a particular area, uh, even something as pro-social as healthcare, sometimes you can get far away from the mission. You know, you, you don't, if you're uh, a finance person, for example, or, or in your case, working in legal affairs, you, you don't, you're not like seeing the kids or moms or people that you're serving always. And so I really encourage your audience to kind of double down on, on their professional area of expertise and think about how they can be philanthropists in this area too. I think it will really bring so much meaning and purpose. Uh, that's something I find with all the donors I work with, whether they are healthcare professionals uh, or not, is that being involved with their, their time and their expertise and their, their donations, their gifts, gives like so much more connection to the mission and so much more purpose and helps them in whatever they do in their other roles in life, their other, if it's, it's a, if it's a job or, or another thing that they do. So I think that's something that, that I hope everybody listening explores as well. Yeah, no, that's another great point. Cause it's, you know, I think a lot of people may think, Oh, someone else will be doing that. Or my skills aren't going to be needed. Um, you know, but so many you know folks that come from so many different perspectives and can provide so many different um, unique contributions that it definitely makes a difference. And, you know, kind of thinking about that, you know, Given some of the recent challenges that we've had, you know, from COVID and, you know, as we were starting to talk about before the recording about, you know, some of the economic uncertainty, does thinking about those alternative non-monetary means of contributing offer, you know, a more attractive avenue or a, you know, a, a way for you to draw in more people as we're going through, um, you know, a lot of these uncertain uh, you know, times and you know, kind of disruptive events that seem to just follow one another over the past right. couple of years. It's like a pylon uh, of, of over and over new things that, you know, if you were putting up risks on a slide to your business model, or in my case, my philanthropy business model, it's like, wait, wait, we didn't expect all of these things to happen in this period of time. Um, but, but yes. So one of the things that I encourage, um, uh, everybody who is a hospital a leader or executive from a system, if you have philanthropy, now is the time to keep going. Even if this is not going to be a great fundraising year for you, or the last couple of years maybe have been hard, it, and next year may be hard too, but now is the time to build relationships with folks in your community and however broad your audience can be to build those relationships and you know, invest in fundraising and development so that development officers like me are out getting to know people and engaging them in the life of the hospital or the institution so that when that person is in a position to make a gift, you already have a deep relationship. And people sometimes say to me, uh, in fact, almost always, when they ask me what I do for a living, they say like, wow, asking for money, that's hard. And I always pause and think, well, when you say it like that, it does sound hard, but usually it's, I'm not asking a stranger for money. Uh, I'm asking somebody that I know or that the hospital knows who's already so committed and hopefully has had these kind of opportunities and to give back that we're talking about right now, Matt, of giving of their time and expertise and service. And so it's sort of like you're on a journey together. And, and at some point in the journey, you get to a place where it's like, oh, we would love for you to be someone who helps make this happen, who helps us philanthropy as a lever to make something new happen. Would you join us in that? And it's just the most natural conversation in the world uh, to have with someone who's, who's been doing these other things with the hospital. Uh, I was thinking of an example. We, we have a really creative group in our strategic communications team. And they're just thinking about all these things you're, you know, we're talking about, Matt. And they brought in a, a group of people, donors and potential donors, board members and potential board members for our foundation um, to do a hackathon uh, on how we do stewardship, meaning how do we take care of your gift and how do we tell you the impact that your gift is having? That's something we take very seriously in this business. Um, the, the accountability to donors. and But maybe we're doing it in a way that's kind of old school. And sure enough, these folks came in um, with all kinds, I mean, this, these are people with industry expertise, some folks who work in 
social media kinds of or, or communications for in a for-profit setting, other people who, who are donors, and just gave us all this feedback. Like, we want it to be real. Give us authentic. Help us connect. If we support a physician uh, or a lab or a postdoc or a clinic, help us connect for real. And again, it's getting to that like source of meaning and purpose that people are seeking in their lives. But having that kind of like, don't give me a written report that's 30 pages long. Uh, give me a, a connection. And so we're moving in this direction of less formal communications with our donor donors and really trying for us in the fundraising profession to be the connectors always of how you know, how, even if you can't meet in person with the physician that you're supporting financially, how do we help you meet on Zoom? Or we record a little video uh, or, or ask the physician to write something in their own words. Um, so, it, so it sounds so authentic and real and makes that connection. So that's just one example of outside expertise coming in and perspectives. It was like a pop-up. Uh, it wasn't a huge long-term commitment, but it was like, come in for a couple hours with us and learn about what we do now and, and then give us your perspective. And uh, we've circled back with some of those folks to, to keep testing, like, oh, oh, we're trying this. What do you think about this? And to just keep iterating and, and trying new things. I think the outside perspective and expertise is so helpful. Yeah, and that seems to be a very key point that you just said, of being, that openness and that willingness to experiment and try new things. Uh, and that seems, and really, that's, I think, applicable to no matter what type of business you're talking about. You know, if you keep trying to do things the same way over and over and over again, it's not going to work in the long term unless you're something so essential that you can just dictate it to the world around you that way. But I don't know if anything like that really exists anymore. Yeah, given right. how I'm searching. The world changes. What would that be? I don't know. But yeah, to your point, I mean, we all have to um, just keep uh, iterating and trying things. And there, you know, two big intersecting schools of thought here in Silicon Valley, um, one about disruption and disruptors. And, you know, we all talk about that and how important that is for, for trying new things. And then the other that I was going to mention is the kind of human centered design. That's very much about like prototype, try it out, iterate, try again, get feedback. Um, don't wait until you can launch your perfect thing. Instead, you know, it's, it's never, you're never going to get to the end. You're just going to keep making incremental improvements. I, that's been really influential for me and my leadership um, and, and how we try to guide our organization. Yeah, no, I think that's a great perspective. And you know, unfortunately, it's also um, how we're going to have to end it because believe it or not, we're already out of Oh my time. gosh. Yeah, I want to thank my guest, Dr. Cynthia Brandt, for a great conversation today. Thank you so much, Matt. And I, I'm so glad to be here and have a chance to bring a message about philanthropy to all of your listeners. Yeah, no, thank you. And thank you to everyone listening. Keep the dialogue going and connect with me at hashtag HCDEJURE. I'm Matt Fisher. Until next time. Mm -hmm.